Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. A reminder, as you're making your travel plans for 2019, think johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate link, so you get all the benefits of going through Priceline.com. You can either name your own price on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, and even more, or choose from several great publish rates. And when you go through johnnydollarair.com, part of the purchase Price supports the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember, when making your travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Now it's time for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date, May the 6th, 1952, and this one was the Burma Red Matter. Johnny Dollar. Well, at long last. What? I say it's high time. It is, huh? Well, isn't it? I don't know. High time for what? High time you answered that phone. And listen. Well? This is Jimmy Bartell. Oh, Jimmy. You know, over here at Mono Guarantee Insurance. Of course I know. How are you? Well, what happened to you, Johnny? Where have you been? I've been trying to reach you for about four weeks now. Didn't you try my call service? Yeah, I tried you. Huh? Oh, no, I uh, I guess I kind of forgot about that. Oh, well, if you had, you'd have found out that last week I was at Grand Canyon, the week before in Corpus Christi, the week before that in Knoxville, Tennessee, and before that, up in Boston. Yeah, sure, Gil, batting around the country while I've been sitting here up to my neck in trouble, beating my brains out, working my head off. <laughs> Sounds to me like you need a plastic surgeon. What? Huh? What's the problem, Jimmy? The Burma Red, Johnny. The what? You heard me, the Burma Red. Jimmy, uh, are you sure you want me and not the State Department? Yeah, I'm sure. All right, I'll bite. Who is the Burma Red? Not who, but what. Well? And listen, we carry the insurance. Half a million dollars worth. You hear that, fella? Half a million. I am deeply impressed. And baby, if you can't get it back for us, that's exactly what we're going to have to hand over. In cold, hard cash. 500 Gs. Well, maybe I had better get to work on it. Good. And I don't need to tell you what your commission will be if you do recover it. What else do you think I'm thinking of? Then the job is yours, Johnny. And, brother, I sure hope that you can find it and get it back. The Burma Red. Right. Uh, just one thing, Jimmy, if you don't mind. Sure, Johnny. Before I start gallivanting around the country, as you put it, looking for this thing... Yeah? Don't you think that it might be nice if I have some slight idea, some inkling of what it is, this Burma Red? I told you. I told you I... Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, come on over here and I'll... I'll tell you all I know about it. Okay. We interrupt this program to bring you a special message to the parents of schoolboy patrol members who were taking the Washington trip. The buses with the patrol will arrive at Durham Union Bus Station this evening about 7.15 to 7.30. We repeat, the Durham Schoolboy Patrol Washington buses will arrive at the Union Bus Station this evening at 7.15 to 7.30. Parents are asked to be present to pick up their children. The, uh... Or the parents, brother, are also asked to use the Sears parking lot. 7.15 to 7.30 the time. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Burma Red matter. Expense account item one. $1.20 for a cab from my apartment to Jimmy Bartell's office in the Spear Building, down on the square. Jimmy's specialty, incidentally, is property insurance, especially where fine artwork is concerned. And in this case... Yeah, Johnny, four solid weeks I buzzed that phone of yours, and what I thought of you for not being there to answer it, it wouldn't be fit to print. All right, I'm here now, so stop bellyaching. But maybe you're too late, fella. He's already gotten out of country with it. The Burma Red. That's right, the Burma Red. Which is what? I told you, Johnny, it's... it's it. Oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't. Now, listen. I'm listening. It was brought over here a couple of years ago as part of a collection by some countess or other. Got written up in all the picture magazines. Do I hear a slight echo? Echo? Yes, from the case I had on my hands last week. Well, I don't know, because I don't know what you had a case of. But listen. Go on. Having been a part originally of the Buckingham Collection over there in England, you know. Well, as you might expect, it was picked up here by Winkler and Winkler. The big jewelry outfit down in New York. The same. Oh, then I do hear an echo. So it's a piece of jewelry and it's been stolen from them. No. 
The same as the Otara's necklace I recovered last week. No, again. For Northeast indemnity. No? No, Johnny. It's just a single unmounted stone, a ruby. But so help me, it's big enough to choke a horse. And now it's gone. When did you say it was stolen from them? I didn't, because it wasn't. They'd sold it to that wealthy old Mrs. Harvey Larriman Brittigan. Lives out in the edge of town. Oh, I see. But four weeks ago, somebody neatly chiseled open her wall safe and walked off with it. Chiseled? Okay, blew it. What's the difference? Plenty. Knowing a safecracker's method can help a lot in pinning him down. No, the police think they know who did it, all right. But what do you need me for? To get that stone back. But if they already know who did but it... But they couldn't prove it. Sure, the modus operandi, the way the safe was blown, it pointed straight to him and nobody else. But also, he was known to be here in town. Who? But they couldn't pin it on him. He had himself a perfect alibi. Who, Jimmy? So maybe it was rigged. They couldn't break it. Jimmy. But, Johnny, it had to be Oscar Mayfield. Mayfield? They held him as long as they could. Went through everything he owns. Checked out every contact he made while he was here in Hartford. And all that got him was nothing. And not very much of that. I'll say this. If Oscar Mayfield, the old master, made that heist... So what could they do but let him traipse merrily on back to New York where he's been living lately? Look, Jimmy... But I figure, despite the police report on all the work they did, I figure that somehow Mayfield got away with that ruby. Jimmy, I'm inclined to think you may be right. I know Oscar Mayfield. He's clever. I've tangled with him before. And, uh, come to think of it, he made a promise to me once. Mayfield made a promise? Mm-hmm. What was it, Johnny? That if I ever tried to interfere with him again... Yeah, well, he'd see to it that I had a very nice funeral... To look neat in the heat, look for Daycron on the label, cause Daycron is a man's best friend. Right then, Daycron is your best friend when it comes to staying wrinkle-free and neat all summer. Look for Daycron in lightweight suits, handsome slacks, good-looking sport coats, too. You'll stay well-pressed and well-dressed thanks to Daycron by DuPont. There's just no denying in the clothes he'll be buying. Daycron is a man's best friend. Expense account item two. 65 cents for a cab to police headquarters where, uh, after some inquiries, I ended up talking with Sergeant Holly Holcomb. He wasn't very encouraging. Sure, Dollar. He was known to be in town. Known to have tried to leave right afterward. Trademark he left on the wall safe was his. Plain as the nose in your face. Mm-hmm. And we pride ourselves on knowing the M.O.s of all the safe men within a thousand miles. Yes, I know you do. And rightly so. But he couldn't pin a thing on him. All the direct evidence we didn't have on him because of his alibi apparently checking out all the way. You know, we simply couldn't hold him on nothing more than suspicion any longer. Yeah. Especially with that smart mouthpiece he dragged in. If he tried, he would have sued us from here to kingdom come. I mean, if you know Oscar Mayfield. Only too well, Sergeant. And you know what I mean. I suspect him just as much as you do. But do we have something definite, some real tangible clue... Well, anyhow, he went back to New York. Have you notified the police down there? Sure, sure I am. Lieutenant Singer at the 18th Precinct. And uh, isn't he an old friend of yours? Randy Singer? He certainly is. Well, I haven't heard a word from him, not in over a week now, so why don't you call him? Or better still, go down there and see him. See what goes. All right, Sergeant. Maybe I'll do that. There was some more talk between us, and Sergeant Holcomb gave me every detail of the job. Told me what they'd found and what they'd done about it. Yes, all the completely unconfirmed evidence pointed straight to Oscar Mayfield. Unconfirmed and unconfirmable evidence because of the man's unshakable alibi. Item three, 85 cents for a phone call to Lieutenant Randy Singer, 18th Precinct, New York Police Department. You mean to say you just now found out about that heist? That's right, Randy, I just found out. See, Johnny, if you didn't spend so much time gallivanting all over the place, you might be of some use around here. You, uh, you didn't get a promotion for all the gallivanting I did for you last week. Oh, darn it, I guess I should have worked that case myself. <laughs> well, how about this Mayfield? You've kept an eye on him? i done everything but tap his phone line. And? Nothing, Johnny, absolutely nothing. 
You just didn't get on this one soon enough. I know what you mean. Unless he's changed these last couple of years, Oscar Mayfield is not one to hold on very long to whatever he's lifted. Right. And if he did snatch that stone, you can be sure he passed it on and collected for it long before this. And yet there's always the chance... So, in the case of a big hunk of rock like that, it means one of two things. The guy who bought it from him is either carting it out of the country and far away, or having it cut up into little ones that nobody will ever be able to identify. I guess Mayfield would have passed it along in one big fat hurry. I know we couldn't find it. Anywhere on or around him, we tried every trick. And I mean trick, Johnny. Until he started to yell at the D.A., and the D.A. started yelling at us. Uh, Johnny, I understand. Uh, I've just heard this, mind you. Yeah? Well, I understand that one of my boys... Oh, well, he was off-duty, of course, so it was completely unofficial, you understand? Yeah. Well, I heard he even went so far as to rule Mayfield one night in the alley back of a nightclub. What? Not a sign of that, Ruby. Randy, if the department ever catches up with these unofficial tricks Look, I told you, Johnny, I only heard that. But I know myself it isn't hidden anywhere in his apartment. Oh, you do? I do. Randy, didn't you and your clever little boys completely overlook the Otara's necklace that was hidden in the back of a camera just about a week ago? Oh, now that was different. So that I had to get lucky and find it for you? Okay, okay. So you happen to guess right. For once. (laughs) So maybe I better get on down your way and look around for myself. Tell me, where does Mayfield live? A hotel apartment over at 614 East 49th. But it's no use, Johnny. Why, just because he's always gotten rid of things quickly in the past? No. Or because you knuckleheads couldn't find the ruby? No, Johnny. You haven't been able to hold him on suspicion and make a real investigation? I mean because by the time you can get here, he won't be. All right, then I'll grab the first plane I can and... What was that? Your pal Mayfield has paid up his rent and he's moving out. He's got himself a reservation on a plane to Mexico City this afternoon. Uh Uh-oh. By the time you get to his place, he'll be gone. Randy... Yeah? Can't a genius like you come up with some excuse to hold him there for me? Oh, flattery will get you nowhere, Johnny. The answer's no. I've run out of tricks. Anything else I might try would only get me into hot water. No, wait, Randy. Yeah? Maybe I know a little trick to hold him over. Well, don't expect any official help from me or the department if you do come down it. What kind of a trick, Johnny? What's the difference? Now, look, if you're thinking of doing something else... Oh, illegal, Randy, how are you That would talking? only get us in order to clamp down on you. Don't worry about it. I'll be in touch. Illegal? I don't know why, but I'd suddenly remember that during my run-in with Mayfield a couple of years ago, there'd been talk about a man who was fencing his stuff. A man who had been only vaguely identified as Hugo. The last name had never come to light. Okay, maybe that name still meant something to him. If so, it justified item four. A dollar twenty-six for a telegram to Mayfield. It read as follows. Urgent that before you make any deal, you call me immediately at Plaza 3 and I signed it, Hugo. And I had them put a rush on it, hoping it would give me some much-needed time. Item 5, $6 for a cab to Bradley Field. Item 6, $10.12 for a plane to New York. And when I got there, item 7 is five eighty for a taxi to 614 East 49th Street. It was a smart, good-looking apartment hotel, which is uh, more than I can say for the stuffy uniform doorman. Mr. Mayfield, did you say? Uh, That's right. Mr. Oscar Mayfield. Is he still here? Is he in? Uh, Whom shall I say is calling, sir? Don't. Uh, Don't? Just give me his apartment number. Your name, please. Don't worry about it. I'm sorry, but I must have your name, sir. It's Dollar. Now, what's the apartment number? Dollar. Hmm. Very well. No, 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 you don't. Just put the phone down. I beg your pardon. It's granted. Now the number of his apartment. Not unless I announce you, sir. Now, look, I, uh, I am a special investigator. Oh, you are? Yes, and if you'd like to call the police and check on me, only I haven't time. Look. Look here. These are my credentials. And I tell you, sir, that unless I... Oh. Oh, I see. Uh, Mr. Johnny Dollar. That's right. The insurance investigator. Yes. I didn't know. Well, you do now. Well, nonetheless, Mr. Dollar... Just I'm give a... me Mayfield's apartment number, please. Now, what is it? Uh, well, it's 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 uh, 7G. Okay, thank you. And I'll phone that you're on your way up, sir. You do, and I'll break your neck. Oh, 7G, hmm? 
Just in case he remembers what he once promised, I better make sure that this thing is working properly. Mr. Mayfield? Mayfield? Oh, got it if he's already flown the coop. Ah, hmm, he left it wide open. Mr. Mayfield? Hmm. The well furnished living room was empty. And so was a kind of study off at one side and a little bar kitchenette beyond it. As for the bedroom in the back, well, as I started through the door, I caught sight of a couple of handbags in front of a chest of drawers. So he was still here. What I didn't catch sight of, though, was the gun shoved around the side of the door into my back. Just lift them up slowly, Dollar. Slowly. While I see whether you're armed. Ah. Yes, here it is. Thank you. Okay, Mayfield. Now, over there. Next to the bed. Go on. Sure. Sure, why not? Are you happy now? Dollar, I made you a promise once. It's kind of foolish of you, wasn't it? I'm going to keep that promise now. You're going to pull off a shot in a place like this? This apartment is absolutely soundproof. One of the reasons I selected it. I see. Well, are you ready? And it looks like you were expecting me, Mayfield. Oh, yes, Dollar, I was. You see, I figured right from the beginning that you might be called in on this case. Then you do have the Burma Red, the ruby. Now? <laughs> oh, of course not. You should know that I wouldn't hold on to a thing like that. Let's say it's been uh, successfully disposed of. And why do you hang around here? Because I'm waiting for... Yes? I was waiting for you. Mm. To settle my old score with you. When I received that silly telegram, I was certain that you would be here. No? You mean I pulled a boo-boo? Your old pal Hugo is dead? I mean that ridiculous number you gave me to call. It's too bad. I thought it was a pretty good idea to keep you trying it until I could get here. Oh, I'll confess it did make me change my reservation to a later plane. But after all, when I got nothing but a busy signal eight times in a row, I uh, naturally called the operator. And she told you? Yes, that it's a number used for testing. That a busy signal is all it ever gets. Hmm. <laughs> Obviously a trick, then. Worthy of you. So I waited for you. And when the doorman, following my explicit instructions, called me, told me you'd arrived, I... Oh, but I'm wasting time. What's more, I'm expecting someone else. So, Dollar, this is it. Expecting me, man? What? Randy! Just drop it right there, Mayfield. Huh? Gently, now. All right, now Dollar's again. Now, sit over there in that chair next to the window. All right, anything you say, Lieutenant. Oh, Randy, you're like the U.S. Marines. Here, you, uh, you better keep this gun of his. You know, I'm just glad you got careless and left that front door open out. I thought I heard a door close just before you made your dramatic entrance. But how come, Randy? What do you mean, how come? Well, from what you said on the phone... So what? I'm off duty. Any reason I shouldn't just uh, kind of drop around for a visit? Oh, I'm glad you did. You know something, Johnny? When? So am I. Now, I'll probably hate myself in the morning for saying this, but <laughs> you know, I've waited a long time for a chance to return some of the favors you've done me over the years. But I've done you. Well, Mayfield? I'm afraid your so-called visit is completely pointless, Lieutenant. You must know very well that you won't find the ruby around here or anything to even remotely connect me with it. Do I need to, after the little party I walked in on? Yeah, that's right. Huh? You can stop smiling now. Oh, very well, very well, if you insist on booking me for an alleged attack on Johnny Dollar with a, quote, deadly weapon, unquote. 
Let us go down to your station house and have done with it. This Grand Central Station? Shall we? Shall we go, Lieutenant? You just stay in that chair, Mayfield, while I... No, am... Randy. While I answer the door. Okay. But leave this one open so I can hear. Right. Yes? Yeesh. What a fancy layout this is. Who are you? Uh, you Oscar Mayfield. Well, who did you expect to find here? Santa Claus? Yeah, well, no, no, no. Look, look Mr. Mayfield, you, you mind putting down a gun, huh? Not till I'm sure you're okay. Come inside. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. All right, now, what's your name? Yeah, uh, Rosie. Uh, Rosie Gilliam. Look, you can frisk me. I'm clean. And that package? Well, you know, it's from the boss. It's from Hugo. It's what you've been waiting for. Oh, it's from Hugo, huh? Yeah, yeah, sure, honestly. He said I should deliver it and get a receipt, then maybe you'd hand me a fin or a tenner. Oh, he did, huh? Yeah. Maybe I better make sure that it's, um, whatever he was supposed to send over to me. Well, you think I'd meddle with it and maybe do myself out of these delivery jobs he gives me and pays me so good? You're on the level? Yeah, you're honest. If you hit it. Now, this contains what I think it does. By the way, uh, where does Hugo hang out? Well, how should I know? All I know is he calls me now and then, meets me at some place, and gives me something I should deliver. I guess you're okay, then. Sit down there while I take a look at this. Yeah, sure, sure. We'll just see now. You know you're the first gent who ever opened one of those deliveries in front of me? Am I? Yeah, you're the very first... Holy jumping, look at that loot! Where is he waiting to pick up the receipt, Rosine? I don't know. He only hunts me up when he's ready. Look at all that dough. What kind of a receipt, Rosie? He said you'd know what kind. Oh, man, would you look at that? Would you look at it? All right, I'll write you one. Yeah, yeah maybe uh, <clears throat> maybe I could have a 20 for bringer. I'll give you a receipt to Mr. Hugo. Um, let's see, how is it now that he spells his last name? You don't know, Mr. Mayfield? Well, don't you know? I should know how to spell Hemperschlag. Hemperschlag. So that's it. And now, wait a minute. Listen, you, you are Mayfield, ain't you? All right, Randy. Randy? Randy who? Lieutenant Singer of the police. Come in, Randy. The police? Oh, no, I've been took. Mr. Hugo will kill me. No, Rosie, I don't think he'll ever get the chance. I just take it easy, Rosie. Oh, no, 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 listen, cop, I was... We'll give you all the protection you need after we sign you in at headquarters. Rosie, whatever your name is, you hairbrained idiot. Just take it easy, Mayfield, and sit down. You too, Rosie. Well, now, look at all this beautiful money. Randy, unless I'm awfully wrong, it's payment to Mayfield for the ruby. And if you can locate a Hugo with the unlikely name of Hemperschlag, or maybe you'll save us the trouble, Mayfield. After all, now that we have his name, and who knows, if you talk, maybe the judge won't throw the whole book at you. Well? <sighs> okay, Dollar. I know when I'm licked, I'll talk. Mr. Hugo Hemperschlag, believe it or not, turned out to be a gem setter for the famous jewelry house of Winkler & Winkler, where he couldn't help knowing about all the important stuff brought into this country, and with the know-how to break it up, after he'd arranged to have it stolen. Expense account total? Well, in view of the commission I'll get on this one, forget it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, I'll be back with a rather unusual story. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber, sound patterns by Joseph Cabibo. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were... Paul McGrath as Oscar Mayfield, Al Hodge as Lieutenant Randy Singer, Ivor Francis as Jimmy Bartell, Jack Grimes as Rosie, Santos Ortega as the sergeant, Mercer McLeod as the doorman. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roger Foster speaking. Derwood Kirby's favorite program, The Gary Moore Show, weekdays on the CBS Radio Network. CBS for Durham, Raleigh, WDNC. Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Our hero triumphs and gains a gigantic commission through his uncanny dumb luck. The reason for Lieutenant Singer showing up when he did was just, it was weak. 
So I didn't like the ending. The news bulletin was also a bit weird. Because we got an interruption of Johnny Dollar to let people know that buses were coming back from Washington so people could go and pick up their kids. I f found myself wondering how big was this trip that uh, a general announcement on a radio show was going to help? Or was it something where the radio station in the school uh, arranged that they would announce the bus coming back on yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and all the parents were listening? Particularly because you're in 1962, and the number of people listening to radio was declining. I mean, were they preempting television shows, too, uh, to let people know their kids would be on the bus back and to go pick them up? Given that I'm guessing not everybody in this area had kids that were on the bus and a very small percentage were listening to radio, uh, it just seems like there might be this invention where you could, could call people up you know, like something like a telephone that, that might be effective. But if anyone has any thoughts on why this might have happened, I'd love to hear it. Now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we have this from Bill, uh, who writes in regarding the Skidmore matter. A few things about this episode. First, I didn't know there was a town in Texas named Skidmore. The only Skidmore I knew of was Skidmore, Missouri, a town famous for the killing of the town bully in broad daylight where nobody saw a thing. Um, Skidmore, there is a Skidmore in Texas. It's not actually an incorporated town, but I checked and it is an actual place because sometimes Johnny Dollar will include fictional places along with real places, but this one is real and uh, it's an unincorporated area and it's about 40 miles from Corpus Christi. So good job on them finding that. Second, I guess Jose uh, must have been a fan of Mr. Keen because when he heard Johnny's name, he referred to him as the famous investigator. When I heard that, I said, Saints preserve us. Maybe an effect of doing the show in New York. Third, it took a minute for me to recognize the song that was used a couple times during the episodes. I don't know the title, but it's the same song that was played on Susan's transistor radio in the debut episode of Doctor Who, An Unearthly Child, 112363. Uh, this episode predates that by almost exactly 19 months. Bill, I did some research, and the tune played in An Unearthly Child was an instrumental number called uh, th Three Guitars, Mood 2 by Nelson and Raymond. And apparently it was played on another TV show, the debut episode of Z Cars, on January 2nd, 1962. So it would have been around a few months by the time that episode aired. So thanks so much for that, uh, Bill. Appreciate it. Joey uh, writes in, these later episodes, Johnny seems to solve the mystery in about 30 seconds, lol. Uh, yeah, I, I do think that uh, that happens because uh, uh, Johnny, because the episodes uh, tend to spend a lot of time on preliminary stuff. And so there's less time for doing the actual investigating and solving the mystery. And then I have an email from Doc. In one sense, your comment about the Skidmore matter was correct. Today, to say that someone was speaking Mexican would not be considered politically correct. On the other hand, the Spanish language spoken in Mexico is a variation of the Spanish language in the country of Spain. I've studied both and can assure you there are significant differences. I won't go into the variations from uh, on... Dulacia to Castile or many of the other regions. Please don't criticize OTR detective shows of the 60s for using descriptions that today's PC culture would consider incorrect. We Americans are criticized daily for not speaking the King's English. My opinion uh, is that is jolly good. Well, thanks so much for the email, Doc. I will say that I generally do not criticize shows for being uh, politically incorrect. 
or the use of various sorts of stereotypes. I take it as read that as an audience, you know, that that was another time and some things that they did on the radio back then would not be appropriate to do today. And that you don't listen to the show to get a lecture on things that you already know. However, regarding the phrase speaking Mexican, I question not if that's uh, politically incorrect, but whether that is actually an incorrect thing to write. Because I've listened to a lot of old-time radio programming set in California, and I've never listened to a show other than that episode of Johnny Dollar that referred to it as uh, speaking Mexican rather than speaking Spanish. If every crime show that I listened to uh, when they were talking about the language that referred to it as speaking Mexican, I'd be like, okay, well, that's just the way they said it back then. But that's not the way they've said it on other programs where I've always heard it as speaking uh, Spanish, particularly from someone who would be in the police force. But thanks so much for the comment, Doc. All right, that'll do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet. Next Friday, another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.